Good evening, folks. We're going to get started. Uh, thank you for those who are virtual and for those who are here at the Creek Meeting House. We are glad to have a, a, an in-person uh, this time, and uh, we hope to have many more of these, both uh, virtual as well as in-person. So thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Crystal Middleton. Uh, Crystal is, has an M MPA in MSIS and was recently the programming coordinator at the Clinton Community Library, where she organized ad adult, teen, and children's programs for patrons in the town of Clinton and surrounding areas. Her prior work in included not-for-profit work in the fields of education, health, and services. Crystal lives in Poughkeepsie with her husband, four daughters, and her many pets. She has just started working in the, in the position of head of user uh, and technical services for the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. Uh, we welcome uh, Crystal. Thank you. I'm going to remove my mask so that you can see me and I um, will see if I can figure out how to share screen here. It's sharing now. Okay. Oops. All right. Um, I just want to give you a sense of uh, what this whole project was about. So I did my uh, library degree last year, and my capstone project was to create something where I collaborated in my community. I was working at the Clinton Community Library at the time, so I went ahead and um, reached out to the Historical Society here because it became clear that um, there was so much information that would be available. So what um, I'm gonna be sharing with you is the final project. Um, but what I did is I tried to explain some of the, um, the purpose behind it. So the final project is a website. It's geared toward early elementary children. And what we decided um, after meeting with some members of the Historical Society was to um, focus on Clinton, New York, 100 years ago. There is uh, so much information available. So uh, this felt like a good time period and uh, we had plenty of material to work with. What I will be showing you are examples of what could be done um, and what, what I did in the areas of farming and schooling. But I do want everyone to keep in mind that there are also other possibilities that could um, that could be done. Uh, and we'll talk about that towards the end. Three points um, that I wanted to keep in mind throughout is that this incorporates accessibility, digitization, and a, a somewhat newer term gamification. And the idea being that making things interactive for kids makes it more fun. So this is um, a little bit more about those three points. Accessibility meaning that children who maybe not, we're talking about early elementary, so kindergarten through third, maybe fourth grade age. Uh, maybe they're not quite able to read on their own, so there are plenty of images. I also recorded all of the writings that were, uh, and I'll show you that, all the paragraphs that explain. And the reading level is appropriate to, um, to kids of those grades. Dig digitization means we preserve the items by making sure that those uh, primary resources are being touched and taken out um, by all these little kids, but that they get to see it on the screen and they can blow it up and get an idea. And then the way that um, I chose to gamify this project is to ask kids questions, and I'll show you what that means. I just wanted to make a little point that 
it's not achievement based. So the children are not asked to um, choose you know, between multiple choice questions, they don't get any points or grades at the end. It is all meant to be fun and they get to choose where they go within the website. Um, I have a little asterisk here. This could be made more interactive. If there were additional resources, funding, for example, or other tools that I may not know how to use um, when it comes to building websites, that may, I may be a librarian, but that's not my um, specialty. So here's what the website looks like when you open it up. Um, it starts off, yes, Todd. I'm sorry, we have yeah. to interrupt for a moment. The uh, people on virtual are not seeing the whole slide. Oh, uh, they're missing the left-hand side of the slide. Just give us a second to see if sure. we can get Sure, let that. me stop share and then come back to it, maybe. Yeah, that might try. Let's try that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So share screen. Is that better? Yes. Okay. We're See, good. I didn't look over my oh, shoulder. No so sorry. Okay. Who knows? Um, <clears throat> we're all learning something new today. So what, this is what the site looks like when you open it up. As you can see on the on the left hand side are the choices. We're on the home page right now, and there are those two farming and schooling links. They're also available right on the home page if you click on the milk jug, the word farming, or the schoolhouse, or the word schooling. So lots of options for kids here. And then I need to figure out how to advance. Said slide, let's see. Okay. This is what, what uh, happens when you click into the farming page. So now we've moved into farming. There is a little description. Um, it's very small, but I wasn't too worried about, um, about it because if you click anywhere on the picture, it should work that if that little, um, it looks like a tiny, tiny set of um, earphones on the top right corner of the picture. If you click there, it's my voice reading that paragraph aloud. So kids who are just learning to read, they can follow along, they can um, listen to it and not have to be able to read the whole word vegetables. However, I did keep the languaging, as I said earlier, um, age appropriate as best as possible. And then when you go down on that page, this is just scrolling down, this is like a guessing game. So that's the gamification of this portion. Now, some of these items may look familiar when you hear from Bob later because all of these photos were taken at Primrose Hill Farm. So the first um, item is photographed and then the second next to it in a grid going down, there are several. And what I did is just for the sake of time show one example, if you click on the blue dot, which actually in, when you're on the site live, it pulsates, so it grabs kids' attention. And then this pop-up comes up and it tells you what it is. So you can first guess what it might be and then it explains. And again, there is a little reader, so it will, you'll hear my voice reading the words as well. Again, because of things like the word refrigeration, a child might know what that means, but reading it out might be harder for the littler ones. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the other page that I fleshed out is the schooling page. Um, and these uh, photos all came from the Historical Society, thanks to Craig. So again, you can click on the little tiny earphones, the photo, and hear me explain. And then the uh, gamification is this is like a yes or no question, uh, game. So there's a question under each, um, with each image, school chores, would you want to do school chores every day? So here are these kids standing next to a water pump. If you click on the orange pulsating dot, this is what comes up, <coughs> excuse me, um, a little pop-up comes up with a water jug and it explains, and again, you can listen to my voice reading this to you, students having to um, do a chore even at school. 
So what I wanted to do is um, also talk to you about what could be done with this website. So it might be great fun for you to go to or a child you know to use, but I, I wanted to put it a little bit more into context. So we have um, the option to use this website in a library. Um, you could show it on a screen the way that we are today to some kids, do some of the um, clicking together. You could uh, give kids some information, um, a pamphlet or a postcard or something that gives them the website, or even sending it to them after, um, thanks to them having registered, they can get an email link. Similarly, a local history program uh, through the Historical Society could have um, some this being one of several options that are kid appropriate that could be shared. And then another place I thought this might be nice is for a school collaboration, having children, I'm sorry, uh, teachers abil uh, able to use the, um, the website in their classroom if they're doing a local history or what was it like to live around here a um, hundred years ago. Uh, I also included um, a, a page on the website for the resources. I wanted to be sure to give extra um, avenues for kids, teachers, librarians, people just who are interested in history or um, the area to link to the Historical Society and the library. And then if you scroll down, this is the resources list and what I call the discussion of resources is actually the uh, paper that I wrote that I had to turn in <laughs> for this project for my classwork. So you get a sense of, and I, I decided not to make slides about this. If that's your interest, then you're welcome to see it there, but we don't need to talk about it there um, tonight. Just to give you an idea, you can continue on with finding out other, um, other ways that history could be used with kids. Uh, then I also wanted to um, remind people, and this is in within the body of the, um, of the research project, but other things that could be done with this model. So if we took this model and we did it in other ways, you could add or expand other time periods, including other people of the area, such as the native people, um, years even before the hundred years ago. And then I also put placeholders on the website for the four topics, buildings, mills, government, and maps, because as I worked in this area, I realized that there's enough already existing that the same kind of um, interactive page could be made for each, each of those four topics. And the resource lists could be um, expanded more towards kids. Uh, uh, maybe there are um, American history museums that kids could be linked to and things like that. The only other thing that I didn't put on this slide that I wish I had is that it could also be built again for an older age group, so middle school or high schoolers with, um, with more links and higher reading level, obviously, and maybe not needing the recording. Although for hearing impaired, that might be still an important thing. Uh, here's, here's a screenshot of when you scroll down the placeholders for buildings, mills, government, and maps, and my ideas for how that could be made interactive before and after buildings, where um, there was a program some time ago with a postcard uh, collection where he, the presentation was showing the postcard of a building or a street and then what it looks like now. So that could be um, made kid friendly in this kind of a format and so on. I also have on the website the reference books that I used to um, inform how I explained the different items that kids can interact with and the links here, the purple underline links you to that item in our uh, in the library collection so you can borrow those books if that is something of interest. This was um, my thought was that this could be used for anyone who's doing this kind of research but especially for um, classroom use. So if a, a teacher says I want you to use um, two of these resources letting kids be able to borrow them from the library is a great way to extend. 
The last thing that I put into this project, which may have been a little of, of an aside, but since uh, having visited with many of you, I know you're from around here, maybe you're familiar with other libraries, is that other libraries use this template, if you will, to do projects in their towns. So if a different town um, historical society has resources that could be made um, accessible to kids in this way. So what I did is I made um, a, pro a project checklist for a librarian to work through how this process worked. And then I also wrote um, a, another paper, not, not that exciting, but it's there on the site if you really would like to read about what I what my process was, how I decided to use what tools I did, and mostly because they're easy to use and um, and like I said, you don't have to be a, a web designer to make a site like this. So it explains exactly how I did everything. Um, I just want to thank everyone who really supported me. They sent me so much information. So Bob, who you're going to hear from from Primoso Farm, um, Craig here at the Clinton Historical Society, and Cynthia met with me and um, helped me decide on when and what to what to feature. And then um, the director at the Clinton Community Library, Carol. Um, and then my, on my end, I was a SUNY Albany student, so I wanted to be sure to thank um, my librarian and my professor. So uh, this is the site, <laughs> sites.google.com, and then it's slash view, slash Clinton NY, slash home. And I think we'd be able to put that into the chat when I am done sharing the screen. Um, so uh, should we wait for till the end for questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to let um, let you meet our next presenter. So thanks so much for your attention and your time. Questions? Yeah. You want me? Oh, now. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I think we misunderstood. So. <laughs> Questions at the end, meaning now at the end of my piece. So does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Do you have any questions? Did you use children as a focus group to see how they interacted with this? Yeah. Uh, your daughters? Yeah. My kids are, so, okay. So the question is, did I have any kids who actually use the site? My kids are a little older than the focus group, but yes, they did try it out. Um, in the introduction, you heard that I recently changed positions at the from the library here to working at the Poughkeepsie Public Library. So I, my plan and hope was to be able to use it this summer with programming, and I'm not in this um, town anymore, so that would have been wonderful. Um, and also, you know, maybe finding time to build out the other um, the other topics. Um, but it's there and and available to be used. I, I don't hold it so close that I feel like it can't still be done. Um, so we'll see. Thanks. Any other uh, questions? Do we have any chats, uh, Barbara? No. No, 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 no. Okay. okay. All right. So I think good. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to pass. It. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Crystal. Uh, we're now we're going to move the, to the second uh, presentation by Bob Schock. Bob is a descendant of the Cookingham family that has owned the principal, uh, excuse me, Primrose Hill Farm on Fiddler's Bridge Road for six generations. For the past decade, he has been buying the farm from his mother and two brothers. He envisions that the future of the farm it will be a demonstration farm, such as past, present, and future, proving that smart farming can be economically viable. He has a long history in agricultural preservation, having been the first professional staff for the Agricultural Preservation Board in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which was one of the first farming preservation programs in the U.S. His presentation for history and farming sets the vision for the Primrose, Primrose Hill farmer. So please welcome 
Bhavshak. Good evening. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I'll speak loud to be sure everyone uh, attending in person can hear this. Uh, so this is uh, my vision of the farm, uh, and it's been shared with my two brothers uh, who both support the vision at this point. As Craig said, I've been uh, buying the farm for the past 10 years for my two brothers. I'm hoping to be able to advance the slides here. There we go. So uh, a little bit more about my background. Uh, I lived at the farm while attending Bard and I did a bunch of work at the farm and also at the Van Vliet farm on Hollow Road. Uh, I went to graduate school at Cornell in regional planning, focusing on land preservation. Uh, and then I went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is uh, where Amish farming is still thriving and started the program for agricultural preservation in Lancaster. Uh, during that time, I met a number of school officials and uh, working on various land planning issues and uh, started to change my career into uh, finance for public schools. Uh, retired about eight years ago and started a consulting business uh, that still is focusing on financial management of schools. Uh, my wife uh, taught elementary gifted students and also is a graduate of the culinary. So as Craig said, the vision includes past, present and future. Uh, that our farm has been farmed for over 200 years until 1957 when my grandfather died. It involved 12 Guernsey cows and it grew 40 types of fruits and vegetables. And we know that from their ribbons uh, one at the Dutchess County Fair Market Basket Competition. Uh, there are a number of buildings on the farm. You'll see some of those in a minute. Uh, the vision includes rebuilding some of those. We have most of the farming equipment going back into the mid 1800s. So I plan to exhibit that in a museum space within the barn and you'll see a photo of that in a minute. Uh, we also have very extensive farming records, including handwritten leather bound diaries, financial records going back into the mid 1800s. Uh, and I am looking to pres preserve those in a space suitable for those kind of records, uh, climate controlled and so forth. Now we have always operated the farm and it for the last 50 years has been sustained largely through Christmas trees. Uh, I'm looking to renew what we had done in the 70s, which was a hang operation, but you'll hear a little bit more in a minute about our agroforestry, a community garden, and some other concepts that would hopefully prove the economic sustainability of the farm. Uh, we also have a very uh, environmentally important farm, and you'll see that when I show a map in a minute. We were one of the first properties in the county to be under the forestry management plan, the 480A program. And we have a federally protected wetland over 13 acres uh, that forms the headwaters of the Crum Elbow Creek that runs down to Hyde Park. So in the future, as Craig said, uh, I'm trying to develop a, what I would call a demonstration farm. Uh, this will take not only the vision and the effort uh, for the, the next decade or so, but also obviously take some financial support. So my brothers and I are uh, going to endow the operation to some extent at least. But we are also putting the farm into a conservation easement so that it will be farmed in perpetuity. So let's talk about the original farmstead. The house is the third on the property built in 1852. There's an original foundation in the far corner of the property that's still in good shape, built in the right around the eight, turn of the century, 1800. Uh, and the second house was about 100 feet south of the current house. My mother was born in the house and uh, she was an only child following the death of her brother, died as an infant. Next to the house is the two-story carriage house. It also served as a corn crib. We use it as the gift shop for the Christmas tree sales. 
We have a wood house. And interestingly, the diaries written in the mid 1800s showed that the farmers spent a considerable amount of time every winter cutting wood uh, from woodlots as far as three miles away. One of them was up near Long Pond next to Omega. Uh, we have a Dutch bank barn. Uh, the Dutch bank Barn Preservation Society uh, experts dated at around uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. It's built into a slate bank. And we've toured that barn a number of times, probably over a thousand people have toured it in recent years. We have a, some chicken houses that were removed due to the, uh, their condition about 10 years ago, or 50, no, more than that, about 30 years ago, actually. And we've been fully solar for the past five years. So this shows the house from the road and watercolor. As I said, it's the third house on the property. Uh, considerable restoration has occurred. It needs further modernization at this point in time, uh, including new train fields. And uh, it is uh, both heated and cooled with high efficiency equipment, uh, which provides air conditioning uh, provided by solar. This is the bank barn. The picture on the left shows the large barn. And to the left side of that is the slate bank that it was built into. So the photo on the right shows that bank, which is an uh, elevation change of as much as 15 feet from where the photo was taken, allowing the farmer to take a wagon full of hay, loose hay at that time, back it into the barn, and then just spill the hay off the wagon into the sides of the barn. The second floor just goes down the center of the barn and leaves a bay about 12 feet wide from the wall into the uh, flooring on the second floor. What that means is the whole barn could be filled up along the sides with hay. Before, this is before baling of hay. So this is a uh, Another watercolor of a chicken house that was one of about five on the property. We plan to rebuild that. Also plan to rebuild the ice house, which was a small, sitting about 100 feet from that chicken house. Uh, there's still an outhouse foundation, probably rebuild that. And there was at one time a cider mill. The carriage house uh, is two floors, needs some uh, structural work and some renovation as do, does the wood house. So here is the bank barn. So what we're going to do on the left side from the ground level up to the roof that's open about 12 feet from the wall into that second floor roof is to use that to display uh, the older farm equipment. We've got quite a collection where we will assemble it in that area, suspend some of it from the existing beams and uh, that will take the farm equipment from the early 1800s and allow it to be displayed. Then on the right side is a milking barn addition, two floors. That's where 12 cows lived. Uh, and that will be turned into a two-story guest house, approximately 2,000 square feet. Uh, and that's where there will be uh, three bedrooms and uh, that'll be climate controlled and the historic records and other things will be kept there. Uh, the other work on the immediate historic farmstead area around the house and barn uh, will be uh, have some minor work done to it as well. So on the left side is a list of the farming items we have. Horses were used until 1948. All the horse equipment, the collars and bridles and things, harnesses were hung up and they've not moved since 1948. They sit in the granary with this mouse proof. But we have things such as stone boats, which were used to move stones away from the fields, built the stone walls, horse-drawn sleighs, all the field tools. We even have the tools, the carpentry chest that was used to build a house and tools to build a barn. Uh, in terms of household items, we have some interesting things like a tin bathing tub, a Kelvinator ice chest uh, built by Kelvinator before they built refrigerators in the 30s and 40s. Well, we have uh, numerous crocs and a lot of other things. Uh, in addition, we have a collection of things uh, that we're going to keep. Uh, and interestingly, 
we have a puzzle collection with hundreds of puzzles, metal and wood, wooden interlocking piece tavern puzzles you may be familiar with. We have hundreds of those as well as handsaw and jigsaw puzzles. I have all the documents. Two of the more interesting ones are an 1850 sale of farm items of by Philip Cookingham and Harlow Cookingham when he was tax collector for Hyde Park, Rhinebeck and Clinton. We have all the tax records going back to when the IRS started and the financial ledgers, a lot of correspondence. We also have the deed to the Federal Aviation Administration for a beacon light that sat on top of the high hill uh, behind the barn. So the present operation will be a continuation of the Christmas tree farming. It takes about 15 of 108 acres. We have a community garden we're looking to expand. We'll do some custom haying, haying on our property and some custom hay, haying, and we're required to continue the forestry management, which is in place for 40 years. We have a significant amount of equipment uh, that you see there and a lot of recent acquisitions that will be used to fire up the hang operation, do some restoration. So this is a map of the farm and it gives you a little bit of the context. So in yellow are the boundary lines for the farm. On the upper right hand side is a 10 acre woodlot. Uh, the rest of the farm though is in the major square, uh, Fiddler's Bridge Road, uh, cuts through the upper left hand corner there. Uh, the uh, managed woodlots are in the white designation with the diagonal lines. The hang is in yellow. The Christmas trees are in green. Uh, and what you're going to see here is surrounding us are numerous other properties that are hayed currently small quantities taken off of a number of properties, but we also have had discussions with a neighbor who's got 40 some horses just to the south. Point being, uh, a lot of this land is being hayed. Uh, the landowners sometimes have difficulty uh, getting that work done. Since we've got the equipment and we're using it on our property, we uh, could help them if they're interested. Uh, the wetland is shows up on the right side there. As I said, it's, it meets the acreage size standards to be federally protected. So this is a unique property, uh, a high hill that gives you views uh, across into the Catskill Mountains, Mohonk Mountain House, even Connecticut into the east. Uh, and that had the beacon light on it. We've had a deer fence around the trees uh, for 30 years. We've had a lot of wildlife, including a bear that destroyed the beehives a couple years ago. And just in the past year or so, we've had bald eagles, bobcats, red-tailed hawks, coyote, turtle snakes, woodchuck, blue heron, and fish in the ponds. We have two fairly large ponds that are seven feet deep. So we're going to build a new bank barn. Uh, this will be located about 500 feet to the south of the historic homestead. There's a 12 foot elevation change that we will put that barn into. It will allow us to uh, store equipment. Uh, and interestingly, in 1995, the farm participated in crop art and we mowed the I Heart New York, I Love New York, uh, into a four acre field that was uh, viewed. It made the back cover of the New York Conservation Magazine and was also viewed uh, when President Clinton and Boris Yeltsin left the summit in, in the uh, presidential helicopters, hovered over the field looking at that art in 1995. So here's a new bank barn, uh, be pretty sizable. You can see the topographic lines there showing that differential in height from 550 down to 530. It's an underutilized area anyway, so it's not going to take any farmland away. Uh, here's the design of the barn. Uh, it allows us to drive in with the equipment still attached for the most part. Uh, second floor would be uh, for hay storage and uh, 
it would have an observation deck on the west side, a ramp on the uh, east side. There's the views of it. This barn should, the construction hopefully will start next year. We look to have it be solar as well. So a uh, big thing that we have done in recent years is started the community garden. We're going to continue that. It doesn't take us much effort to maintain it. We put a deer fence up uh, and we rototill it annually. It's right next to the pond, so it's irrigated. Uh, by the way, we also have irrigation for the Christmas trees from the pond that we've used occasionally whenever we get a drought. So in conclusion then, I uh, just wanted to mention that we are going to put a conservation easement on the entire property, meaning it will no, it will not be possible to further subdivide it. It will remain as a single 108 acre parcel. Uh, we were one of four farms in the Hudson Valley to be funded through the state and county government. They pay the difference between the development value if it were divided into 25 acre lots versus the single parcel value as a farm. And they compensate you for that difference, which is about a million dollars. So that's underway. That was approved back last fall. Uh, we may see the money in the next four or five months, hopefully. So that will form the endowment for what we plan to do with the farm, the start of the endowment, portion of the endowment necessary to uh, do things such as put roofs on all the buildings. One of the reasons we have these buildings is good roofs were put on these buildings 75 years ago and they've been maintained. So there's a lot of obviously uh, expensive maintenance on a property like this. So with that, I'll just open for questions or comments.